politics, and current events. From the housetops, coming up next. This week we have Muriel Delaney presenting an excerpt from Father Leonard Feeney's The Communion of Saints. What is a saint? God wanted from all eternity to make us one with himself. That is why he created us. He wanted not merely to be our creator, but our father, giving us the title and the right to say to him, Our Father, who art in heaven. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, who became man, prays for us after we receive sanctifying grace, which divinizes our soul, and after we receive the Holy Eucharist, which makes us concorporeal with Jesus, that we may be one as thou, Father, in me and I in thee. Holy communion makes us concorporeal with God made man. After receiving it, we are one body, one life, one breath, one heartbeat with Jesus. No one who reads the Bible, God's book, can fail to see that the whole purpose of creation by God was the divinization of those whom he had created. Our time is to be eternity. Our life is to be everlasting. Our happiness is to be that which God has in being God. In all the prayers of the Catholic Church, one of the most constant utterances is per omnia secular seculorum, which means forever and ever. A saint is a created being who has corresponded completely with God's intention of divinizing him and making him holy. The word saint comes from the word sanctus in Latin, which means holy. The term sanctifying grace means the divine favor by which God elevates a created being to his own state of holiness and shares with him the everlasting glory of being God's own by adoption. The communion of saints is the greatest brotherhood or sisterhood that there ever could be in creation. It is the union of all those who have been sanctified by God. The word saint, used in its highest sense, means someone already in the beatific vision, whose heroism and holiness achieved on this earth have been acknowledged and approved by the Roman Catholic Church. But in a simple and initial sense, anyone can be called a saint who is in the state of sanctifying grace. St. Paul in his epistles refers to all early Christians living on earth as the saints. He does this over 30 times. Our Lord's beautiful way of letting everyone know that the early Christians were truly saints was when he said to St. Paul, who was then called Saul, not Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou my followers, but Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? The greatest of all expressions of Christian belief is the Apostles' Creed. In the Apostles' Creed, there are 12 articles, each one of which was written by one of the 12 apostles. The ninth article of the Apostles' Creed is the expression of belief that those who are in the state of sanctifying grace are saints, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. Those who die in the state of sanctifying grace even when they go to purgatory, are saints. Those who have been purged in purgatory of all their offenses and have gone to heaven are saints forever. Those who have been outstandingly holy in achieving this goal while on earth are saints in the highest sense. There are, therefore, three states of sanctity applied to the saints by the Catholic Church. They are the church militant, those who are or can be put in the state of sanctifying grace and are fighting to keep it as living members of the one true church. The church suffering, those who have died in the state of sanctifying grace and are being purged of their defects in purgatory. And the church triumphant, those who have gone forever to see God and know God as God knows himself and are united to God in his eternity, in his infinity, in his glory and in his happiness forever and ever. The word communion, when used in the term of holy communion, means that in our flesh and blood we are made participators of the body and blood of Jesus. 
So intense is this unity in what is called Holy Communion that after having received it, any Catholic is entitled to say along with St. Paul, and I live not now I, but Christ liveth in me. Every little Christian child who has been baptized and who has died before reaching the age of reason, before the age when he can commit any willful mortal sin or fail to confess the one true faith to which by baptism he belongs, goes immediately to the beatific vision. He or she is a little saint by sheer grace. There are millions of such baptized infants in heaven, and they can be prayed to, and they pray for us. Anyone who wants to be a saint can become one. Our Lord's challenge in this invitation is most beautiful and clear and definite. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. Those who are meek, who are mourning for holiness, who are hungry and thirsty for what God wants to give them, who are admittedly poor in spirit, shall possess the land and shall be comforted and shall have their fill and theirs shall be the kingdom of heaven. Those who want to be saints shall receive God's mercy. They shall see God, shall be called the children of God and shall possess the kingdom of heaven if their own sanctification is their first goal and if they want to be saints. They are the salt of the earth. They are the light of the world. Everyone in the world is called to be a saint. Those who are not Catholics are called to become Catholics. Go ye into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. Everyone who is in the Catholic Church is called to be a good Catholic or to come back to the state of sanctifying grace through the sacrament of penance, if he has lost it by sin. Every Catholic in the state of sanctifying grace is called to be holier and holier, so holy that the Church can declare him or her a saint. We shall possess the land. We shall be comforted. We shall have our fill. All we need is to be meek and longing with tears for what is to come, and hungry and thirsty for what God has to give us. We are called to be the salt of the earth. God wants us and will make us the light of the world. That is, if our aim is to be a saint. Let us consider among the saints the contemporaries of Jesus. When the term communion of saints occurs, which is identified in the Apostles' Creed with the term the Holy Catholic Church, it is wonderful to see all the associations with God we are allowed to make and must make by way of the marvelous unity that occurs between him and us through grace. All the people on earth now, by way of the presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, are contemporaries of Jesus. All those in the state of sanctifying grace are his living contemporaries by way of divine life. There is no union or unity or intimate association in the world that can compare with the communion of saints. Just mention one saint, and you will immediately have to associate him with other saints, and eventually with all the saints. So beautifully one is the communion of saints that just to know when a saint lived and what his name was and where he lived lets you know immediately hundreds and thousands of his thoughts. Take such examples as these. Every 25th of December, in every year since the coming of our Lord, we know what every saint was thinking of. Every saint named Peter, and there have been many, including three doctors of the church, St. Peter Damien, St. Peter Chrysalgus, and St. Peter Canisius, was frequently thinking of St. Peter, the first apostle. All three of these saints never forgot St. Peter's feast day and never failed to beg protection on his feast day. Through faith we can read the minds of the saints, even in the past, even hundreds of years ago. The communion of saints is such a beautiful and transcendent unity that any one phase of it you think about leads you on and on and on 
to all the constellations of doctrine and dogmas, and doings and dates and dear ones that were being divinized by God and are now with him in heaven. The devices for doing this are so many that one hardly knows where to begin. But just by way of showing what unities there are between the saints and the centuries and the thoughts of God and the teachings of the church, let us look at some of the contemporaries of our Lord. That is to say, those who were alive when he was with them in flesh and blood in his active life on earth. St. Joseph, the virginal spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary, died in the year 29. He was 60 years old when he died. He died in the arms of Jesus and Mary. St. Joseph's genealogy is the first one given in the New Testament. He is foretyped in the Old Testament by Joseph, the son of Jacob. St. Joseph was tall, handsome, and noble. The angel Gabriel called him son of David. It was St. Joseph who gave Jesus his name, as he had been told to do by the angel. It was St. Joseph who circumcised Jesus. And knowing his love for Mary's child, who was divine in soul, body, and blood, in his human nature as he was divine in his divine nature, we cannot imagine St. Joseph throwing away the precious blood shed at the circumcision. Joseph sits upon a magnificent throne in heaven, and every time his name is mentioned, all the saints bow. His sublime dignity is so great, by reason of being the spouse of Our Lady, that it is impossible to express it. St. Joseph was made in the image of the Blessed Virgin, his spouse. Both came from the same ancestors. Jesus never refused to do the will of St. Joseph here on earth, and in heaven will always do anything Joseph asks. The power of assisting us in our necessities is given to St. Joseph unlimitedly. He will help us in all our needs if we invoke him with confidence. He was the only one found worthy on this earth to be the spouse of Mary. He was called just because he perfectly possessed all virtues. He was more beloved by Jesus and Mary than all other creatures. Just as St. John the Baptist was the last of the prophets, St. Joseph was the last of the patriarchs. After God the Father, no father can compare with the dignity and paternity of St. Joseph. St. Joseph lived for Jesus alone. After the Blessed Virgin, he was the first and most perfect adorer of Jesus. He is the model of all priests and superiors. He is the beautiful guardian of our chastity and the protector of all those dedicated to virginity. Having the title of Father of Jesus, he has the power, by God's grace, to command God. We'll be back with more from the housetops after this break. Listen to Larry's Music Loft every Sunday at 11 a.m. right here on WQPH. Here is his version of Made of Orleans. We remember thee. You were guided by the voices of St. Michael and Margaret, Catherine and Gabriel. You followed where others fell. A shepherdess and her flock, your country was in peril. Seventeen years old, with God as your rock. Oh, made of Orleans, we remember thee. You died for love of God and country. We remember thee. You walked up to the king with Jesus by your side. You had no sin of pride. To the field of battle you did ride. To lead a bold attack on England to the north. With faith there we must go, only heaven knows. O maid of Orleans, we remember 
for thee. You died for love of God and country. We remember thee. You led a throng of men with sovereignty to defend your banner of Jesus and Mary. Flying in the wind, you held on to the line, the wounded, you were undaunted. History repays your name beyond time. O maid of Orleans, we remember thee. You died for love of God and country. We remember thee. Captivity found you at the siege of campaign. The enemy tried to break you. At the trial, your virtue had no stain. The judge said, do you have grace? You said, if I am not, may God put me there. And if I am, keep me there. O maid of Orleans, we remember thee. You died for love of God and country. We remember thee. Senses to be burnt at the stake. The English lit the fire. The smoke of the Holy Ghost rose higher and higher. You prayed, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You sold like an arrow from a quiver shot up through the air. Oh, made of Orleans, we remember thee. You died for love of God and country. We remember thee, we remember thee, at Jago, we remember thee, at Merling sur we remember thee, at Beaugency, we remember thee, at St. Pierre Lamboutier, we remember thee, at Pate, a Pate, a Pate, we remember thee. We remember thee, had Montpelier. We remember thee, Lani, Lani, Lani. And more than thirty cities surrender without a fight by your power. Ooh, we remember thee. When Our Lady appeared to the children of Fatima, one of the things she said to them every time she appeared is, I want you to come here on the 13th of each month. So I like to promote our candlelight processions at the Shrine of Our Lady of Fatima in Brighton on the 13th of each month from May through October at 8 p.m. We have Father Ed Riley who's coming, who's a chaplain of the World Apostle of Fatima and a regular at the Shrine. So please join us, 8 p.m. 155 Washington Street, Brighton. Hi, this is Tom Price from EWTN saying thanks for listening to WQPH 89.3 FM, Catholic Radio serving Shirley, Fitchburg, and the world. Because Our Lady was told of the conception of John the Baptist on the Feast of the Annunciation, March 25th, 1 B.C., and because of her wonderful generosity and love, on March 29th, Our Lady set out for Ein Karim, where St. Zachary and St. Elizabeth, the father and mother of St. John the Baptist, lived. Our Lady arrived at Ain Karim on April 2nd. That was when she was greeted by St. Elizabeth as the mother of God, and that is when she spoke her beautiful canticle, the Magnificat. When Our Lady arrived at Ain Karim, in the house of St. Elizabeth, St. John the Baptist, three months before his birth, 
was sanctified in his mother's womb. Mary was conceived without original sin. John the Baptist was born without original sin. Our Lady stayed with St. Elizabeth until John the Baptist was born on June 24th. She also stayed on until July 1st, the day he was circumcised and given his name, a name chosen by God. It was the angel Gabriel who told Zachary what name to call his son. Our Lady left Ein Karim the day after John the Baptist received his name, that is, July 2nd. This day, the day of Our Lady's ending her visit to St. Elizabeth, is always celebrated at the Feast of the Visitation. St. John the Baptist was the last of the prophets. He was the one who pointed directly to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who taketh away the sin of the world. His words are repeated in the Mass every day by every priest. All the true prophets were holy men and wonderfully pleasing to God. The one thing they were prophesying and foretelling was the coming of Jesus and the coming of Mary. St. Peter was born ten years before our Lord. His birth year is 10 B.C. He grew up to be a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee, called the Lake of Genezareth. Because fishermen are the simplest and most childlike grown-ups that can be, God wanted one of such men to be the foundational head of his church so that everything could be taught to man in the innocence and simplicity of a child. St. Peter had his frailnesses and weaknesses, as everyone knows. Before the cock crowed twice, as our Lord prophesied, Peter had denied our Lord three times. When he had come to a realization of what he had done, he began to weep bitterly. No one was more contrite or sorry for his sins than dear St. Peter. And because our Lord loved contrition, our Lord still retained him as his own. St. Peter's nobility of character and courage of belief are shown in his great utterance to Jesus. When Jesus said to the disciples, Whom do men say that the Son of Man is? They answered, Some John the Baptist, and others Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But when our Lord said with a strong voice, But whom do you say that I am? Peter spoke before all the rest and answered with his strong voice, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter's name had been Simon. Our Lord said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, Simon son of Jonah, because flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. St. Peter was with our Lord at the raising of Jairus' daughter from the dead. He was with our Lord at the agony in the garden. He was with our Lord at the transfiguration. When our Lord died, St. Peter stayed in Jerusalem for three years, and then knowing that our Lord had come to his own, and his own had received him not, he removed the church to Antioch in Syria, where he stayed for six years. And finally, in the year 42 AD, St. Peter moved the church from Antioch to Rome, and there it will stay until the end of the world. Rome is now the eternal city. St. Peter's death was one of the most dramatic incidents among all the martyrdoms of the saints. He was crucified in Rome, but because he was happy to be crucified and yet did not deem himself worthy to die in the same manner as our Lord, at his own request he was crucified upside down. He died in the year 67, the same year as St. Simon and St. Jude the Apostles. His head is in the Church of St. John Lateran in Rome. Part of his body is in the Vatican. The rest of his body is in the Church of St. Paul's outside the walls. This is to show how precious the Church thinks his relics are. St. Peter ruled the Church for 34 years, the longest reign of any Pope. St. Peter's name is the first name always named among the Apostles. St. Paul was born in the year 1 B.C. He was one year older than our Lord. He was born in Tarsus in Cilicia, a Gentile country, 
and though a Jew, he was a Roman citizen. His Jewish name was Saul. He later changed it to Paul, which is both a Gentile name and also indicates his appearance. Paulus in Latin means small. St. Paul, although a handsome man, was not tall. His friend Barnabas, an honorary apostle, was the extra handsome one. So of these two handsome apostles, Paul was small and Barnabas was tall. St. Paul studied under a Jewish rabbi in Jerusalem named Gamaliel. Gamaliel knew that the Messiah had come in the person of Jesus, and so after our Lord's death, he gave up all his honors and became a Christian and a saint. The feast of St. Gamaliel, the finding of his body, is August the 3rd. St. Paul was present at the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr of the church, in the year 36. St. Stephen, although a Jew, also had a Gentile name. The name Stephen means crown, and the feast day of St. Stephen is the day after Christmas, December 26. Birth and blood go together in these two feast days. At the stoning of Stephen, St. Paul held the garments of those who were throwing stones. On the road to Damascus, he was struck blind, and he heard the voice of Jesus saying to him, Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? He was then converted and baptized a Catholic by St. Ananias, whose feast day is January 25th. St. Paul became the great apostle to the Gentiles. He was ardently devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary. His companion and disciple, St. Luke, a sheer Gentile, wrote the Gospel of Our Lady, the third of the four Gospels. St. Paul wrote more books than anyone else in the Bible. He wrote 14 epistles. St. Paul was martyred the same day as St. Peter. Because he was a Roman citizen, he could not be crucified, so he was beheaded outside the walls of Rome. When his head was cut off, it bounced three times on the ground. He uttered the holy name of Jesus three times. Three fountains of water sprang from the ground where his head had bounced. Three Gentile soldiers were converted to the Catholic faith. St. Paul's relics were divided into three parts and put into three separate churches, along with the relics of the body of St. Peter. It was Our Lady who asked that St. Paul's name be always mentioned after St. Peter's in all the litanies where the apostles are mentioned. On the feast day of St. Peter, June 29th, St. Paul is always commemorated. And on the feast day of St. Paul, June 30th, St. Peter is always commemorated. These are some of the contemporaries of Jesus, and they will never forget for all eternity that they were contemporaries of the Word made flesh who dwelt among us. From the House Tops is produced by the slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Still River, Massachusetts.